My name is Komal. I'm the editor at Architectural Digest. And uh, welcome to India Art Fair. Welcome to this conversation. Um, I want to say the Art Fair has uh, opened the doors for design. We finally got a foot in the door. <laughs> we have a bunch of architects and designers and editors of design publications here. So thank you guys. But uh, I mean, very happy to be here and to be hosting this session. I'm going to do this a little bit quickly because we have five people and 45 minutes. So if this feels like a bit of a rapid fire, please just go with it. Uh, I'm quickly going to thank you for the lights. I'm going to quickly introduce everyone, introduce the topic, and then we'll go with it. Uh, firstly, Sonali, why don't I start with you? <laughs> Sonali Rastogi is um, uh, the founder of Morphogenesis uh, that she founded with Manit Rastogi, her husband, 25 years ago. And it's the one form that I can tell you is taking ecological and cultural sustainability quite seriously, not just jargon. Then, why don't I go to Feroz? Feroz needs no introduction. I want to say, I just, um, Feroz is Feroz, you know, a powerhouse with a heart of gold. Can I get away with that? <laughs> but also, I want to point out the founder of uh, the Gujral Foundation. We just saw the, the previous presentation on the life and work of Satish Gujral. So um, Feroz, along with her husband Mohit, founded the Gujral Foundation. And Mohit, by the way, is also an architect. And she's the daughter-in-law of Satish Gujral. I'm only saying this because I don't want to go into the extensive work that she's been doing in art, because I'm assuming this audience is familiar with it. Or you should be. But uh, just to sort of say how much her life and work and family is infused with architecture and design. So that's Feroz. Uh, Sunil, uh, V. Sunil, is, his background was he's previously a creative director in advertising. The Make in India campaign is to his credit. My favorite is the Jodhpur uh, regeneration, urban regeneration project. It's this massive urban revival that he did in Jodhpur a few years ago. Also Motherland, one of my favorite magazines. Sunil, I want the entire archive. <laughs> just saying it, and uh, Amit, the editor-in-chief of STIR, and uh, you know, the thing with STIR I love is that it's not, it's not sort of stuck in this global local dichotomy, it's a very forward-looking sort of progressive design journal. Sometimes I've felt a little bit of envy looking at it because I'm like, why didn't AD get that story? <laughs> but yeah, and um, you know, also vis-a-vis. -vis. Uh, Amit started vis-a-vis -vis so long ago, I mean, so much ahead of its time, I felt like um, you know, opened the, opened the India market to sort of the magic of global design uh, brands. So that's Amit. And Ashish, my friend, <laughs> I'm trying to go so fast, sorry. Um, Ashish, I feel, has sort of, you know, uh, managed to distill this clear India design identity with contemporary craftsmanship and almost functions like an art practice and does it with so much flair. So um, uh, some of the best projects that we've covered in AD are Ashish projects. So also, I want to announce that he's now part of the design collection, which is this super sexy global design collective. Some of the best brands are on it. And now Ashish is part of it. So congratulations. As of tomorrow. As of tomorrow. All right. OK, the topic for our day is um, art, design, and architecture, and the spaces in between. And I think I will, I mean, I'll very quickly stop my monologue and pass this on to everybody else. But it should, I mean, it, it possibly will be about, you know, how porous or stretchable these boundaries between art, design, and architecture are. And if there are boundaries at all, like, you know, the people on this panel, uh, in practice, their work is sort of always in these in-between spaces. So I think let's hear from them now. All right, let me. What must, uh, why don't I start with you, Sonali? I'm going to go in the same sort of. Um, creating a habitat is whether you're building a house or a, or a sort of public space or an office, it requires so much. Um, you know, it's not purely architecture. You're creating a time and space for people to live, to work, to dance, to do whatever. And it kind of always spills in so many other places in life. So as an architect, do you think that you're purely only working as an architect, or isn't there more to it? So architecture is one profession that can never ever be purely reliant on a architect or an architect, because it is a community profession. I mean, it's I cannot even uh, guess that each project that I do, how many people are involved in it. 
and clearly they are not all architects. So um, it has engineers, it has creative people, it has, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to name the whole list of consultants, but more than anything else, it has the culture of the community that we are building for involved in it. So, so it has the time that we are building in involved in it. It has the context that they are building in involved in it. So there's direct involvement of a bunch of people, but there's a total in involvement of the entire context that we are sitting in. And whether that context has to do with technology, uh, whether it has to do with um, artisans, whether it has to do with um, global financial markets. So there's just so much that is um, overlapping into what it takes to make a project or a building mm. that this is definitely a profession which is not built by an architect. Well said. You know, the other thing I want to point out about morphogenesis is that, so design thinking is this sort of academic uh, theory that you, you mostly when you go to architecture school or in design school or theory, you read about it. But in my sort of work uh, in design journalism, I see very little of it in practice. And so Nali and Manit's firm is one firm that have kind of almost used it as a tool to in, in, in everyday practice. And it, it kind of... Uh, also lives between, uh, you know, lots of different spaces. It's got several different parts and how all of them come together. So, Nali, you want to talk about those crossovers? Yeah, so I think I, I'll have to go back to the fact that um, looking at work in, um, uh, in an intellectual way before you begin to look at it in, in how you're going to uh, uh, manifest the idea is something that comes from my education and my partner Manit's education. And uh, he, he's a trained environmentalist, uh, along with being an architect. And I studied under extremely conceptual masters uh, at the Architectural Association in London. And between both of us, I think um, the desire to um, make something of that education is so deeply ingrained when we return back to India to work and to I mean, we've always had great architects in this country, and understanding context and manifesting work as per that is almost in our architectural tradition kind of inherent to it. But to bring um, an alternative way of looking at it from the perspective of environment, and, and please remember, when we started practice here, green was considered a green terrace, right? So Stay from here. that time, um, over a period of time, the um, acronym sort of we've developed as a way of thinking design is SOUL, sustainability, sustainability, optimization, unique. Unique specifically referring to the fact that, you know, crafts are dying, artisans are suffering, and all of that story is like told a million times over, but uh, re-energizing that community to make the work unique and bespoke is something that has been at the center of our thought process. And of course, the work has to be livable for what tomorrow's Indian community is looking to be, wherever, whichever part. It's all different in different parts of the country, that I understand. But, and it's not that this happened in one day. So working now, the practice together is 26 years old, working over 26 years, and uh, kind of working in, we really, really like to be parasites on other brains. So kind of in our very parasitic way, um, have, un have developed the fact that these are the four processes or four lenses through which work must be seen for it to be, um, you know, uh, kind of um, be more than just visual imagery. And whilst visual imagery is extremely important in my profession, I mean, we've been all having sort of visceral reaction to all the vi visual imagery around us. And I do want architecture to have those reactions as well. But, but besides that, the various lenses that it needs to be seen through is uh, started with my education, but is an ongoing journey, which I think there's lots more to achieve. Sounds good. Um, I want to say if at any point anybody else has anything to say about somebody else's you know, statement, please just jump in, stop me and jump in. Um, Firoz, if I may ask you, you're the only person on this panel who runs an art and a sort of culture program and you've been doing it for so long. I, I want to understand from you, how does art and culture fit in these in-between spaces that we're talking about? Thank you, Koma, for having me today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. The Graveyard Shift. So I'm very happy to see all of you. Um, 
I think this is a, it's a very important question because I think in India a lot of things are segregated a lot. So by virtue of the foundation and the kind of projects we do, the kind of um, programming we have, a lot of it is taking art or culture, cultural intent and putting into exhibition making. And in that process of getting to exhibition making, we actually work with a lot of architecture and a lot of space. And by virtue of making the exhibition, we also then create a place from the space. So it's also place making. So these, these are the kind of things we're very, very conscious of when we have projects uh, in different realms. Um, from there, of course, you have, you know, what is the community and the response and the impact of that. So this singular line we trace in all our projects, and I think a little bit of what Sonali said, she has you know, the acronym SOUL, so it's a bit like that. We, we are conscious always that we must, if we put up something, it has to be relevant, it has to have impact, it has to have resonance, and it has to end up in memory and therefore heritage. So it's a long thought for most of our uh, you know, major projects. Um, just a couple of examples. Uh, for example, we did a project in Venice. We picked a very, uh, very prominent palazzo on, uh, on the canal. It was expensive. It was an expensive choice. But the point was that we were representing a subcontinent. And when you represent a subcontinent, it's not just the foundation or an art project. You're on a world stage. Then you're representing one third of the world's population with our subcontinent. And what does that look like? So. The place, the actual architecture was very important, that we were downtown, upfront, and important. And the second thing was making that space into our place. So when you came into the exhibit, you always felt I'm, it's a visceral feeling of India and Pakistan, for example. Or in Shanghai, we picked up a very, very prominent chimney that's in the middle of Shanghai, which has uh, the temperature gauge. And everybody can see it from all over Shanghai. So why did we pick that? It was a difficult site. It was an improbable site for a very beautiful light piece by Vishaldar. But the point was that we wanted to have something which sat well with the project, but also engaged the population who doesn't know you. They don't know our name. They can't pronounce you know, our name or anything else. But they knew where it was. So location and architecture and design of that that structure was key in that project actually shining. So similarly, to, to extend that into perhaps a greater realm is taking locations and making them destinations. And a perfect example is the Kochi Biennale. Thanks to Sunil and Bose. I can see you somewhere. Um, Kochi is, is, as most of us know, in, in Fort Kochi, a tiny lost part of, of the nation. And just by virtue of positioning and uh, imagining a Biennale in that location has made it a global destination. So this kind of powerful impact of cultural, uh, you know, kind of um, seeding in a space that can rebirth, that can reignite, that can reinforce, rechange. You even have a Biennale coconut now. Coconuts are for like 10 bucks, but the Biennale coconut is 200 bucks. So even that has become an artistic expression of that particular thing, that cultural movement. Um, and of course, we have something like Bilbao, for example, right? A forgotten town doesn't exist. And then we have great architecture, great design, Frank Gehry, great design, and then extraordinary art. And now everybody knows where Bilbao is. It's a dot in the middle of nowhere, right? So this is the kind of cultural, uh, you know, artistic intent in public space. And this idea that bringing something, enlivening something that is uh, a space and definitely uh, uh, importantly making place making, that it becomes a place. And then slowly it becomes a place perhaps in a memory in your heart, on a map, a holiday destination and a forever point. So I think that's something which we are very, very focused on. We, we understand it. And uh, thanks to the architect husband that I'm always reminded that, you know, what is the point of this place? Or what is the point of how will it impact? How do you move? How do you sense this, this, uh, this uh, particular expression of culture that we are very conscious of architecture and design and happily married to it, I will say.
No, such a great example of Bilbao. I feel like just public spaces, they, they are illustrative of what we're trying to say over here because they're just at this intersection or crossroad of so many things that, you know, what boundaries are we talking about? Anyway, Sunil, if I can come to you now. Um, it all sounds very exciting and inspiring and, you know, lovely, charming, but I'm gonna ask you a realist question. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is the central challenge or like the most fundamental challenge to working in a landscape which is so sort of, you know, bizarre and borderless and you're and off the grid yeah, yeah. What, what is the m basic challenge um, anyway <laughs> thank you for coming and this is like a tough question for me so <laughs> I'm trying to say it like as nice as possible um, I think one of the one of the big problem right um, it's when it when we work with multiple partners it could be architects could be graphic designers music I find that there's a sort of, you know, uh, lack of professionalism mm. from the creative industry. Like we work with all kind of people, you know, it could be anyone, Airbus to, you know, kitchens to whatever. But only time I kind of dread going to meeting is when I have to meet creative people. Because they'll <laughs> always be late, right? 99% of the time. Very rarely like someone comes on down like, oh my God. So, I think that it's just not thing we're coming late. There is this. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's to do with our uh, 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 design education. You know that that training it lacks that sort of commitment and discipline to work. You know that really. You know that what happens with, with that is that a lot of people don't then take the creative people seriously. Mm. You know so and then it becomes like very clumsy. The whole thing. So if that's not fixed. I think we won't move fast, mm. you know. That I mean, it's fine, you know. We'll all work great work, but if that's not fixed, you know, that we really slow down with yeah. the progress, you know. So the young people won't learn, and that 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 cycle will never sort of change. It's changing, yeah. but still not good enough, you know. For us to do the kind of work and kind of scale, I think we need like huge change at ground level, at, at school level, you know. Yeah. Uh, when we're doing, you know, the one of the big challenge when we were doing the Make in India project was one of course like you know getting government to like really like we need to at least have three, four policies before we really launch. But then from there then to like work with multiple partners, states, you know, um, other government. ministries. Yeah, other ministries. When I say states like other ministries then uh, all kind of departments, right? So we used to have when we did that Bombay thing, we used to have meetings like literally for a month, we were meeting ten different companies or the states or whatever every day, we would have some very exciting meetings with, let's say, Navy, right? Mm. Like when you talk about frugal sort of design, Navy is like the masters. Like Indian Navy, Shining everything is done here. Mm. They don't use anything from anywhere else. You know, the industrial design, the, the, the aesthetics, it's all done here. And then you meet design schools. Mm. I really had that, you know, we met Navy, then we came to the next meeting that was, I won't name it, oh my God, how depressing was that? You know what I'm saying? So yeah. even for the government to really take the creative industry seriously, that's a contrast. And that meeting, everyone is like, yeah, what is this meeting? That cannot happen, you know? So I just think that that, that change has to happen from really like the school level or yeah. education level, I don't know. Yeah, also systems level. System, of government. course, systems level, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the government, no, see, the government only will move if there is a pressure. See how they're getting behind this whole startup culture. They didn't start it. It started by the, you know, the, the people, you know. So, and all these things like a NASDAQ, all that came because of the, the size of businesses. The movement has become so big, right? Like Kochi governments, like they've been supportive from the beginning, but now they can see that the impact, you know, how it impacts tourism, how it impacts the, the, the larger ecosystem, you know. Uh, even in Jodhpur, we've seen that if we, if the private sector don't make that move as a collective, government will just keep waiting, you know. And uh, because if, if left to government, they also know that. See, they know. I think a lot of the people in the government, you know, um, especially at IAS officers level, they know the systems and they know their sort of um, um, limitations. So that's why they they very keen to work with private sector. 
often when the private sector and the government work together, I, I've seen the, the, the real push don't come from private sector, often. It, it's, it's not hard enough, you know, because uh, they need that. That's why they reach so out. So I'll steal a minute and yeah. give you a really interesting current example. Right. So as we speak, uh, within four, exactly four years of which two were pandemic years, yeah. In India, in a sleepy little town, has the world's largest building has been made. Yeah. And I'm certain majority of you, most of you, probably all of you don't know about that. And as we speak, it is getting inaugurated uh, in Surat. It's the world's largest building. Current, now the Pentagon, which was the world's largest building, is the world's second largest building. Built in four years, two years in pandemic. Uh, and this was entirely funded by 7,000 diamond merchants, and they built it for themselves, and diamond boards in Surat. Now, going back to education, there's been zero discourse. Yeah. There's great imageability, great story, a community building for itself, people who would otherwise four hours in the morning be on a train to Bombay and four hours at night, and barely get four hours of sleep and be at it again. Yeah. Now they're all going to be there, funded it together, built it with no loans, no BlackRock, no Blackstone, nobody involved. and it's finished in four years. Wow. So this is something like also the discourse for storytelling. Yeah. And I'm dead certain yeah. no international media, nobody is going to pick it up and have it on the cover of anything yeah. or on their CNN news or anything. So part of it goes to our um, education of lack of discourse, yeah. lack Absolutely. of ability to express the narrative. Absolutely. And, and whilst the work will speak for itself, and I buy all of that that I, w I was grown up with, but an absence of a narrative also stops the entire belief system coming together. Yeah. See, the Sundar Nursery, sorry, like, you know, it's like, what a great project. Yeah. You know, in pandemic, yeah. they were actually building, you know, against all odds. They've had, you have no idea the kind of problems they had. That, they were actually cutting through a, a, a highway through Sundar Nursery. Now imagine stopping that. That's the level of work. He's an architect, actually. He's not some big policy guy, but he just works from morning to night. You know, you can turn up there at six o'clock, he's there. Make sure it's all cleaned. You know, so that level of commitment to the project. And he's struggling every day. Every little change is a struggle. You know, every stone, like if it's this high, there's a problem because it's, uh, you know, uh, archaeology survey, then something else is like part of Delhi government, some other thing is part of like urban development ministry. So, and he's just this one man just swearing away. So if there is kind of commitment or maybe courage, system will turn around. What can they do? They can yeah, shut I you down, but like it cannot shut down for that long, you know? Yeah, I think creative, is this on? Hello? Yeah, it's on. I think creative people also kind of have, um, you know, it's, it's okay to, uh, like you said, not turn up on time. There's a little bit of uh, sort of cultural attitude to being not working in a system. But I think for anything to really galvanize and come together, you, even creatives, as much as you want to have free thinking and free thought, you need to go to work. You need to have a work ethic and turn up and do the job. Anyway, to come back to our sort of, you know, in between spaces uh, conversation, Amit, if I may come to you, uh, I find that, you know, the, the thing that I was talking about, Stir, earlier, that it's not, it's not stuck in one box or the other this or that global, local interiors, art, design, photography, typography, which is fine. But what I wanted to ask you, as a storyteller, um, do you think those categories even matter? Like that's just possibly for us to organize content in our heads. But as a storyteller, those boundaries, do they exist for you? Hi, uh, thank you all. And <clears throat> when we start talking about boundaries, boxing, unboxing, you know, I, I strongly believe that art is an architecture minus the engineering and maths. And any built environment is a creative expression uh, from architect's perspective where uh, when you create a space, uh, it has a real manifestation of various expressions which could be crafted, which could be artistic, which could be engineering, or which could be a form-led. Um, we feel, I mean, th this is a very Eurocentric uh, uh, division between art, architecture, and design. I mean, I'll quote when we were interviewing her recently, we were interviewing Eric Chen, uh, who today is one of the most uh, sought after curators in the world. Um, and we got to talk to him personally. And he said that this 
uh, this division is very, very Eurocentric. Since early 20s, Art Nouveau days, they've been trying to blur these boundaries. You know, Ashish works in all medium. He creates a space. He creates an amazing artistic sculptural format. He creates furniture line. So uh, how, do you, how do you define that as a, as, how would you define him as a prac uh, uh, and bracket him as what he is? He's an artist, he's a sculptor, he's an interior designer, he's an architect. And today I think it's important to blur those lines and that's the reason, though yes, because we are, there is always gatekeepers of art, design and architecture, we do have um, art, design and architecture labeled on our stories, but we don't categorize like that. We actually categorize them as see, see, think, inspire, reflect. You know, see and be seen, think and inspire, and probe thinking, um, inspire and be inspired by, reflect, within and around. Um, and that's the reason we, and we cut across various disciplines. And today, I mean, we recently launched a series uh, just before Oscars, uh, where we interviewed five Oscar-nominated winning set designers. And one of them won the Oscar, Dune guy won the Oscar. And, and Academy sent us a mail saying, very rarely are set designers get talked about, and we did live interviews, I mean, I think video interviews with them. Or uh, Preeti is sitting here, I mean, uh, how would you define, why wouldn't you not say there's an there's a overlap between a communication design or a, or a physical manifestation of a space? We interviewed Paula Scher uh, under a series which was called, uh, you know, Design on the Contrary, or, or Conversations on the Contrary. It went up beautifully. So for, for us at Star Curatorial, yes, we do have strict boundaries that, okay, here is art architecture and design because of gatekeeping and institution and because our education has been uh, imparted, but the, but the way technology is into, has come into our space and the way technology is going to take, take things forward with uh, what is happening in the world of NFT and metaverse, I don't think there will be any lines between the three. Um, and every format is a creative expression and at the, for us it's creative community creative expression, which could be driven by any expertise or skill. Right. And to add to that, when you talk about creative expression, uh, you know, which field you're working in, whether it's art, design, or architecture, I feel like every creative person is trying to say something. It's either a personal, individual uh, message, or it's a collective cultural message. And maybe that is, it's, you know, it's the age-old medium versus message uh, argument that which field you choose is a matter of choice. You picked that. But what you say with it, the message, is what should drive the sort of workflow rather than... What field end. you choose is your skill and your inclination. But it doesn't mean that, the, the, that you are need to be branded as this is who I am. You are a, an expressionist to start with. Post that, you can then branch out to do many things. And, and, and therefore, for us, we try and dissolve these categorization uh, as much as possible. And, and, and even, to be honest with you, uh, talking about local, global, and, and this duality between, and dichotomy between what is local and what is cultural context and what is uh, global, um, that's also, with the current generation, it's all blurring. I mean, today, do we call STIR an India media house, or do we call a British media house, or do we call a, a Japanese media house, we a global media house, we could be based out of India, run by a bunch of brown people, but, um, by no way we are an Indian media house or, or a British media house or a Japanese media house. 80% uh, of our audience is actually from all over the world, you know, so, yeah. Thank you. Also, what you said about Ashish earlier, I feel like your practice from the very beginning has been like this sort of, you know, moving between spaces and you've come a long way in trying to, you know, for lack of a better word, we say artist designer or designer artist, like how do you even identify somebody anymore? Uh, in which bracket do you, do you put yourself? So, I mean, not to sort of prompt you to say the obvious, but do you see yourself in a bracket? Is there a bracket at all? You know, there, sorry, thanks Kumal, but you know, I think there are brackets everywhere, you know, I mean, from design to art to even product to multiple different facets that I face on a daily basis because, you know, I. I wear multiple, um, in one flowing into the other. Yeah. I want to kind of con take it from the more macro scale and bring it to the micro scale because I mean, these uh, you know, celebrated people on my left do work on much larger scales and almost on city formats on more, uh, a more m a macro environment. I kind of decided to go more micro because I was seeing the gap of crafts in India. 
and the way it was represented or slightly misrepresented uh, from the worldview perspective. And we did, we started this R&D cell seven years ago um, as just to understand what we have within the environment of our country. Um, sorry, and that's where we found a big gap and we found a lack of structure. So what Sunil was speaking about, the creative industry not having structure, when you go down there, there is, it's a complete mayhem. Um, and we started finding that a lot of problem was just uh, wastage of material. Um, so that's where we started kind of working with them and understanding how that could be kind of formatted and worked into our practices. So we started using their products as just doorknobs or handle, or converting them by just tweaking their products. And then we moved to the larger practice of designing pieces once these had mastered that communication gap. Um, so, I mean, I digress from the original question, but I, when I walk today into the fair, um, I'm actually a bit saddened because I find that the, there's a lot of representation through bracketing. And, you know, I find that uh, what I thought of art 10 years ago it still exists the same, you know, the, that movement has not happened, you know, we're not seeing, um, I would love to see more crafts, I would love to see more design slash art, I would love to see more uh, expressions of NFT, which is going to happen in the future, but I, I would have expected it this year, you know, I expected uh, the fair to have taken a slightly more turn towards the future uh, post the two years of, you know, all, all of us sitting at home and having time to think. Right. So, yeah. Like Art Basel has designed Miami. I mean, yeah. but hi, even Art Fair. Yeah, <laughs> but even, I mean, I was in March, we were in Dubai for the fair, and there was an entire different section for digital art. And it was such an eye-opener. It was a great learning experience for me because, I mean, I do see that coming. We don't know where it stands at this point because it's, it's a cusp of us understanding the reality and the depth of it or the real value of how an NFT will change our lives, or the metaverse will become our second avatar. But it did give us, gave me great insight into what are the possibilities of the future. No, very well said. You know, you mentioned in between about these large scale projects, so I, I'm gonna wrap up very quickly, but Sunil, one more question for you, because you know, one t when the Jodhpur uh, regeneration project was going on, he actually took, he was generous enough to sort of walk me through the old uh, J uh, Jodhpur city. And at, at one point, I th think this was a few years ago, we walked up to the Mehrangar fort and there was this ruin and we were standing there, spectacular sit setting, the entire Jodhpur city is in front of us. And you were talking about, like his conversation was going from this massive sort of overview, visionary uh, view of what it should be, to specifics, to like, you know, if you're going to call, s you're, if you're trying to invite tourism, where are they gonna park their cars? So I feel like when you're working in this landscape which is so borderless, isn't that sort of the key where you're looking at an overall vision but you are also intense about the specifics and the micro strategies? Please right. elaborate. I, I think, you know, that that's kind of critical for, especially if you're leading a project, right? Um, to have that, you know, what we call it, I mean, it sounds like a little dramatic for someone coming from advertising, but uh, I, the way I approach is like big picture and uh, really like mi minute details. And the in between, I don't really emotionally invest my time on. I just think that'll happen and it, it, it happens actually. So if you do that, and it, that's a kind of discipline we follow, right? Really get into the detail, but that big picture, whatever, you know, that we always have a balance, like, you know, it could be art and science, or whatever that intersection, and we keep that balance, like it's like how ATC tell a pilot to fly the plane. So that doesn't change at all, you know? So if you kind of strictly follow that, and so far it's sort of worked for us, worked, I guess. Worked well. <laughs> I think Ashish success. also used the word scale. Yeah. And I think in our context, uh, where there's like millions of people, millions of craftsmen, uh, lots of urbanization still to happen. So what I've enjoyed, uh, I too like him, work on a micro and super macro scale simultaneously at almost every single day of my career. Uh, but I think like for example, uh, introducing earthen pots as insulation material all over Rajasthan versus normal insulation mm -hmm. actually has revitalized thousands and thousands of potters and has made pottery a regular construction material. Right. Wow. right. So, so for me, unless it's done at that scale, 
it becomes a museum piece. It becomes an artifact to admire, yeah. but it doesn't actually change as per what the potential of the time was to change. In Ahmedabad, uh, built what is what young students call parametric wall, built, and Amit was part of the, that project, uh, built three ginormous parametric elevations, 200 meters by 30 meters each one, and Corten steel looks absolutely, the other fancy yeah. word, iconic. However, it was done by Kansaras folding the iron because actually we didn't have the finances to get the computation done to that level where machines could do it. Mm. Whereas anywhere else in the world, machines would have done it. I'm hoping with what we achieved, there is no need for those machines to come in. And yeah. hundreds of Kansaras were busy for two years, and Amit has been witness to it, just folding iron day in and day night out in the way they know how to do it. So, and of course, where what goes and where that vector is and where it has to be pinned was digitally supported. So I think working on a larger scale with a micro detail output in my mind is, is the, the only way forward. It's the only way to do it. Yeah. Okay, I just wanna, since you know the, the presentation before us was on Satish Gujral and I walked in late, I saw just the last 20 minutes of it, but I thought it was so telling to what our conversation is about because he was this prolific writer, poet, sculptor, sculptor, uh, architect, um, fine art, like I don't, I don't even, I mean, isn't that it? Like the what boundary are we talking about? I mean, sure. Firo, yeah, Firoz, is there anything on your mind? I think um, definitely we're talking about boundaries and spaces in between and I think one of the things one learned living in a house with him uh, was that there are no boundaries and you are limited as you limit yourself. And that definitely is, uh, you know, unfortunately in India, education system is very uh, compartmentalized. We are taught to compartmentalize. You go to a course in any international college, you can do architecture, and you can do forensics, for example, or food, or something music, or ballet, or something else. Here you can't. And it also limits you that if you are over a certain age, you can no longer get an education in India, or if you miss that one opening, you know. So I think there is a lot of innovation in India. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, we learn from our craft, we learn from our heritage. If we can go back to go forward as everybody else does. Yeah. <coughs> but we have a knack of leapfrogging. And leapfrogging is something that is very Indian. So you don't have electricity, but you have a Kawasaki motorcycle outside. Or you don't have a toilet, but you have a cell phone. Yeah. Right? So we live in this, these binary worlds of the future and the past and it's all okay, you don't realize. I don't have a toilet in my house. Yeah. But I have the latest cell phone, I'm on a scooter, I'm taking a flight, it's all okay. But that is also our magic. Yeah. And from that stems a different kind of design and a different kind of conversation. And I think we're beginning to more and more have it. But we're also a very, very large country. So it's very hard to know what somebody's doing in another part of the country. So I think what we need more is, is also the platform building. People are doing these extraordinary things, you know? It's just that whether what Ashish do is doing or what Sonali is doing or what Amit is showcasing or you know what he deals, Sunil deals with or what we deal with, we see so many extraordinary voices, talents, but we need more bridges. So if you ask me the outcome of this talk is that you know we all know each other, but I never see anybody because we're so busy in our own little myopic kind of rat hole that you never look up and say, oh, I better talk to so-and-so. So I think that is really my big in between uh, post pandemic is I'm, I'm excited to see what's coming. I'm excited to see where are all, where is all the futuristic tech that we're supposed to see even in the arts. Um, I, I'm not gonna judge the fair because I think the fair has been two years in the making, it's been really hard. Yeah. So I'm just happy to be here at the fair, but it's definitely coming and uh, India is extraordinary. Our sense of design, our aesthetic, our culture is just so rich, we don't need to look elsewhere, but we do need to build more platforms, you know? And, and just taking forward, Feroz, and also the subject of our talk in terms of blurring lines between, yeah. and between art, architecture, and design, um, the more collaboration happens across various multiple dis Absolutely. Uh, it's disciplines. Absolutely. Uh, and that, and it, it should go down to the educational level, to the, to, to the built level. Um, I think the economy will, will take a different form. Also, like Sunil said, you know, we're not used to paying a fee, so we don't care. The fee in this nebulous world of architecture fee, design fee, you know, um, art 
to pay for art. We don't like paying for something that is sublimal. We don't understand that it's the only riches you really will have is all these things. You yeah. know? Art yeah. marks time and makes history. So without us... We are used to paying for uh, the printer for a wedding card, not Stop. the designer. Stop. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> You're right. We pay for the tent because we can see it, but we don't pay for the design who designed the tent. Thank you. I think on that note, um, I can wrap it up. Do we have time for questions from the audience? Yeah? Uh, does anybody have any burning question? Hi. Thanks for this amazing talk. Thank you, everybody. So I know all about what you have spoken about, architecture, sustainability, and how it should go back to our roots. And you also spoke about how you've not seen much of convergence out here. But I would like you all as architects to say, how have you used your architectural canvases for art beyond sustainability and solutions for public space? Because the West is really doing it beautifully. You know, public art today in India is really, there's a lack of space. It's very difficult for public artists to traverse those red tapism. We would love you architects to come forward and provide canvases for more artists beyond murals. There's lots to be done, digital art, AR. I mean, I'm here, I'd love to do it. I'm from The Missing Project, and I'm waiting to see some really exciting stuff. Thanks. Any, any, any answers? OK, I'm going to answer that one. Um, I think we're, I hate to say it, but we're one generation away, uh, in the sense that you, people forget we're a very old country and a very young nation only 70 years old. So this idea that what, th what is happening in the US, they're 20, 250 years old as a nation. So this idea that we should be a par with everybody, it's not going to happen. We're not going to happen. have the museums they have. We're never going to have the kind of intervention of art and architecture like they have. What we will have is a new way, and our own way, and something we're used to, painted walls of Shekhavati, or incredible you know, terracotta facades or so many other wall paintings and things. So it, we're going to revive our own ways. So I don't think we can ever judge or gauge us from what somewhere else, something's happening somewhere else. That's not going to happen. So it's going to be something new left to you with the project to create a new, offer us a new thing. I mean, and we will do it. Really, the world is moving so much where every 15 years could be an adolescent. And they don't really gorge us by our, this what we don't have. They want excitement, and we really have to shape them. And they're not stopping. Today, digital art is huge. I mean, I totally feel the lack of digital art. Exactly. So we leap again. We leap. We, and we don't we're ready have to leap public art, but, but we're we ready to leap with, because leap I believe again. architects will play a big role. Cities is going to play the biggest role. So we'd love to you all to think about it. For sure. Hi, I'm Saba. Uh, what I want to ask is that she brought up the topic of the United States uh, and you know us. The difference is that, yes, they're 250 years old. Economically, they've been uh, uh, advanced for a long time. There's been plenty of that surplus they've generated, even individually, which they've been able to, as individuals, invest back into art. There's a culture of philanthropy, for want of a better word, or there's a culture of being deeply involved in, in building institutions or you know, being private donors and so on and so forth. When is that sort of thing ever going to happen here? Because I think we are also generating billionaires, we are also generating ultra h &Is, but I don't see that culture on the horizon so much. And what does it take to come to that point of inflection where things like that start happening? I agree we are only 70 years old, but you know, do we have that sort of a future in terms of uh, Mindset. So Sabah, I'll answer that because I've worked from within the government as uh, been in the Delhi Urban Arts Commission for five years, re till recently, as well as a practicing architect and a lover of public art. So it's not going to happen because over the years, the policies have only changed in such a way that there is actually nothing called public land. You know, you don't have, so it's, um, if you want to go install a sculpture, where will you install it? It'll have to be in, uh, if it's not private land, it has to be government land. And the policies do not 
have, have only downgraded over the years. So even from within the government, it's, it's impossible to make up policies that will promote this. So it requires a complete mindset change. And art and architecture is seen like a contract. It's seen like a L1 contract. And Mohit sitting here will, will know that. So the lowest tenderer gets it. So art is al also acquired like a bag of uh, cement, as is an architect, as is an artist. So till that mindset doesn't change, that a bag of cement and an architect and an artist and a public art is all the same thing, is all the lowest tenderer, till that time, it cannot change. So it's as much as I would love to change it and Feroz would and everybody and you would, it won't happen till there's a policy shift. So, so it, whilst it can happen on, I mean, there are enough people who could be philanthropists who are billionaires and they are a little bit invested and they can be more invested, but it will happen at their private whim and fancy. And I hope it does. But at the country scale that we live in, for it to percolate, it needs to happen through governance and policy shift. I, just to add to what Sonali is saying, 7% of US GDP is creative economy. 3.5% of UK GDP is creative economy. Um, it happened at the policy level. It, and, and that is what I think the point that Sonali is trying to make. And also, you know, the, the, I think education, the, again, that, you know, right now if you look at the uh, amount of, uh, you know, billion dollar companies are coming out of India, right? It's just shocking. But none of these kids or even the grown-ups, they have not grown up going to museums and galleries and so that culture is just not there, right? If you're growing up in Italy, you, you would just, maybe you don't like art, but you like football. So if you are like a Gucci or Prada, you would go and like, you know, sponsor a football stadium and you will really take care of it, right? And that's because they just, there's, there's a love for something more than just business. And that's a culture they grow up in, you know, so we don't have that, you know, till the time that happens, so more of, Art Fair, more of Binale, more of uh, Jaipur Lit Fest. I think that's when the change will happen. You know, before Art Fair, how many people in Delhi was like, you know, only those few collectors were buying art. Now you see in the 10 years, more people are buying art. I think that's how change more will platform. come. More, more platform, absolutely. More Kochi, platform. now people fly down all the way to Kochi to just see art. You know, it's also fun, it's sexy. Earlier, the culture was if you go to, you know, even if you like art, when we were growing up in Delhi, even like till recently, you, if you were not like that intellectual type, you were kind of rejected from the art world, right? That's one problem. Second problem is that even if you if you go to a place like Lilith Kala or somewhere, it's depressing. Why would you go there? It's not exciting, it's not sexy. Like, show me one museum you go to and say, wow, it's such an exciting day out, right? We don't have that. People go to Sundar Nursery and they look at the birds and trees and they're excited, right? Bihar, it feels, Bihar yeah, Bihar Museum. But what I'm saying is that you need more and more such place where people, you know, then people have to like kind of learn and experience rather than being told. Otherwise, everything is like, you know, yeah, so much. So look, one chief minister, the yeah. art museum building. That's all, yeah. And probably the only museum that yeah. makes sense today. Yeah, yeah. Like in Kochi, we have both governments, you know. Yeah. In, in Kerala, you have, you know, left and yeah. Congress, all the, but <laughs> they have seen the proof of pudding. They can see a, a Binale year and the non-Binale year, what happens to the tourism, you know, that it, it's just, it's real for every taxi driver, every, uh, restaurant, every hotel, guy. yeah, even the coconut guy, that every year changes. It's a drastic change in, you know, that excitement and, you know, and you can see that every year we know that how, how much people love the curator. You can see the love for the curator every year clearly, you know, that, that there's just love for that person and it just changes every year and you can see the gauge of that excitement from the public, you know. So I think more and more platforms will change that. That's only and one fantastic one is coming up. When is Kochi in December? <laughs> 12. 12. 12. 12. So, 12. yeah, so. You see everybody at Kochi. Sitting right there, you can answer. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap it up here before they send me another slip. Um, thank you, everyone. My mic, sorry about that. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you to the art fair people for having us. <laughs>